So, good afternoon. Hello, uh, my my name is John Board. Um, I've been on the I've been at Duke for many donkey's years at this point. Um, I'm on the faculty in electrical and computer engineering and in computer science. Um, I was actually at Duke as an undergrad um, and uh, left briefly to do, do some of my graduate work overseas in England. Um, but I've been back here on the faculty 33 years, I think in January. And for 13 years, I've also had a role in um, administering IT services for the campus. Excellent. And so what has changed from when you first came to Duke um, 30 some years ago? Oh to my, now? What, yes. is, what is the greatest 40 change? years ago, 40, yes, yeah, 70, yeah, set, fall of 78, um, so long time ago. Um, Duke was a very different place. Uh, Durham was a very different place um, in, in um, you know, 42 years ago. Um, Duke was not a major research university at that time. We had a great hospital, um, uh, but um, the College of Engineering where I was, was um, you know, very much a teaching college of engineering. Some of the faculty who'd been hired um, uh, since the space race began were doing research and the language actually used um, uh, that they've told me uh, from the dean at the time was uh, they could do this research thing if they wanted to this research hobby thing of theirs as long as it didn't interfere with their real job of teaching um, so well, while I was there as an undergraduate uh, the deans had changed several times by then and very much we were on the trajectory of trying to make Duke a much more um, research focused place. Terry Sanford of Outrageous Ambition Theme was our president at that time. Uh, my department chair had been hired from Bell Labs, a, a very well-known researcher in his own right, mm -hmm. uh, to try to, uh, to um, uh, start that trajectory. As an undergraduate, I was mostly oblivious to all of that initially. Um, but I got into the computer biz even as an undergrad here at Duke and, and I got picked to run the first serious computer that the School of Engineering had. Um, so I've seen Duke grow, um, I've seen Durham grow. It was still active tobacco factories at that time. Um, and, um, and I've seen you know, information technology obviously grow dramatically in, in that period. Um, Durham was a um, uh, not a very dynamic town uh, mm -hmm. in in the uh, in the 1970s, early 1980s. Um, it wasn't yet because the factories were still operating. Downtown wasn't quite the wasteland it became for about a decade there mm -hmm. um, after the you know the the factory shut down and before um, the uh, Renaissance efforts began down there. Um, but there was very little to do in Durham proper, uh, except right around Duke, we had 9th Street. Uh, we went to Chapel Hill a lot more than I think students do now mm -hmm. um, uh, in, that, in that time period. Yeah. So in terms of the student population, that I imagine has changed a lot too. Um, oh yeah, so we were extraordinarily non-diverse when I got here. Uh, very much, um, you know, a, you know, a, uh, you know, a, a a teaching college in most disciplines that appeal to white students, mostly from the Northeast. Mm -hmm. um, I think North Carolina was fourth or fifth on the list of states where students came from, is New York, New Jersey. And, um, but it was very East Coast as well. Even West Coast weren't here. I knew one Californian mm -hmm. and he was considered, um, you know, a bizarre oddball. Mm -hmm. uh, and almost no international students. Um, I, can't, I can't think of any who, certainly lived in my dorm or were part of my immediate peer group in my major in mm -hmm. the School of Engineering. So no international students, uh, some students of color, not very many. Mm -hmm. um, um, the engineering school was very male um, at that time, um, uh, so not many women in engineering. Um, and uh, th and no, that's absolutely, the, the demographics were very different back then. Yeah. So, um, you know, I work in the law school and um, one of my, um, my dear, dear friends was the second or third black person to graduate from Duke Law in 1969. And uh, 
often he tells me about the sit-ins in the Allen building and all the things they did to, to kind of rethink, right. you know, diversity at, at the university. And often as he talks about these things, he comes, a little bit of it is reticent and a little bit of it is just, you know, joy, you know, like, so the agony of going to law school being one or two out of a class of 50 or 60, um, you know, um, and I think they recently just had the anniversary of that sit-in. He talks right. a lot about the diversity of Duke then and the diversity of Duke now. And he said it was almost always made more men than, than there were women in almost any of the schools. There were more men that, than Except that. Except in the School of Nursing. Well, of course that. <laughs> which does. we had back then, which was essentially 100% female. Yeah. But, yeah. And he was saying that, you know, like what he's, you know, so he taught at Duke as well. He uh, taught critical race theory at the law school and, and a few other things. And he was a federal judge and he's, he's done a lot of amazing things in his career. And uh, when he talks about Duke, he says, the thing is, is Duke is always two places. It's never just the university. It's a university research and, and teaching, he said, but it's also a place where culture is almost right down the middle of learning, right? So the university culture and what it's like to be a black or a brown student in a university in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. And, you know, they've had one child go to school at Duke. And he, and he often says, you know, like the culture of Duke is almost always based on what the overarching view of the board of trustees and the, and the president, you know, and it kind of vacillates, you know, one way or the other. Um, has Duke changed from that much? You know, has, has Duke become more um, embodying of a more universal theme of education? Oh, I, I, I think absolutely. Um, uh, in... Um... Certainly in my own school, I, I, I don't get to see the deep goings on in departments far away from me in the humanities, as it were. But um, in the parts of campus that I frequent, um, you know, the embrace of, um, you know, the importance of educating, you know, preparing. We are desperately short of technology workers in the U.S. And we cannot afford to say there are filters on who gets to be a technologist. Um, and I think, you know, it has been good for me to see that the school takes this seriously. It's hard because the pool is small because the pipeline issues go so deep in this country, all the way back to elementary school. Right. Um, but um, um, the, to see the change in emphasis over the years, especially in faculty hiring, you know, faculty hiring is one of the weirdest things in the, in the world in the United States because we're making effectively lifetime offers mm -hmm. to people um, if they're you know, productive and, and successful. And uh, that means every faculty position is precious. And if you are not using every faculty um, hire opportunity as, as a chance to think about, are we pre creating a, a faculty that gives the, uh, the best possible set of role models to a diverse set of students, then we're not doing our jobs right. And I've been, I've been pretty pleased with how that's played out, even in a, in the disciplines where it's tough, like in engineering, where both our pool of women and our pool of minority candidates simply is small because the pipelines are small, um, better than they were. Um, Duke has among, I haven't seen the data for the past couple of years, but Duke has one of the most female engineering student bodies of any engineering school. Um, and that only happens by active work. You've got to, you know, and, and also you have a bit of a, um, of an advantage. Once you're able to say that, you're able, I think, to attract more people. That's why it's really worth putting the effort in on the front side to uh, persuade there's sufficient critical mass here that you will not feel that you are, um, you know, the lone or the outsider, the only girl in the lab. Um, there are enough here. Now, of the four departments, mine is still probably the worst. Um, and so there's still lots of work to do, but at least engineering as a whole has now, um, the faculty is quite diverse from point of view of, of women versus men, uh, some progress on racial diversity as well. Um, um, and all of that helps in, in I think, making Duke a, a less unattractive place for students of color and women to consider coming for technical education. Yeah. So in recent weeks, we've seen a lot of politics around international students. 
um, you know, especially if universities are going to go completely uh, online or remote learning um, and the effects of that on international students, their visas and all of those kinds of things like that. And uh, a part of my role at the law school, we hire a lot of students to supplement our staff because we don't have deep funding to hire as many technicians as we, we would need. And so the majority of our student intern computer workers are from Pratt and the majority of them are brown. Majority of them are brown from India, China, you know, Japan, wherever they're coming from. Um, and what's really been interesting about that is that we have been thinking about like, how do we give them the real life experience that they can go away from what they get from Pratt and what they get from working in the law school, you know, helping solve technical problems, especially wicked technical problems. And we've seen so much of that impact them. And what I often do is after a student has graduated, I'll get a letter saying, can you write a letter of reference or telling me about a job that they were going down this trajectory and changed their mind and went that way because of the time they spent with us over in the law school. So that said, you know, if, 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 when I don't, I don't, I haven't heard officially what Duke is officially going to do yet, but if Duke does go to remote learning or completely online learning, what does that mean for a school like Pratt, where a good majority of your students are international students and come from? Yeah, certainly, that's absolutely true. Of some of our graduate programs are, um, you know, ninety percent international students. Some of them, the undergraduate student body, you know, is as a high domestic component. But even the undergraduate student body is about one sixth international, right. of all of all stripes and colors. Right. Um, but yeah, some of our graduate programs are 80, 90 percent um, and India and China are, are the two dominant countries. Um, it's it's a major challenge for mm -hmm. us. Um, we have you know become a major center of, of education for Chinese students uh, uh, interested in being trained in certain things that we're actually pretty good at, like tra uh, training them to be good software developers mm -hmm. uh, is one of the things we pride ourselves in. We started new programs in financial technology and, and cybersecurity, they're too new to say how good a job we're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have done a good job in, in training developers. And frankly, uh, that revenue is important to us too. And so, I mean, right now, none of us have good answers. I, I can only say personally, I was thrilled that Harvard and MIT uh, immediately um, took uh, the US government to court over this to try to get clarity. Um, and understanding alliance. And I've, and I've generally liked the messaging from Duke so far, which is, you know, said we are going to explore the maximum amount of flexibility that uh, the, the law allows to allow the greatest possible number of our students to do the greatest number of things. But it's, I mean, it's fundamentally a, a tough problem when the government is making decisions that many of us find simply to be spiteful and fundamentally um, unfair. Yeah. And, and so with that said, if, if, if this does come to fruition, because I did see the class action suit at uh, Harvard and um, MIT and a few others have put together to think about this, if this does come to fruition that um, international students will have to either learn remotely or find something else, how does that look in the in the college experience, because what I hear so often about Duke is the college experience, the whole experience, not just you know what you learn in class, but the relationships you build, the people you have relationships with. What does that look like if if that is indeed the case that comes from um, from the result of this lawsuit? Well, the I think frankly we actually have a better job of pulling off a compelling and valuable education remotely for many of our graduate programs than we do for the undergraduates. It's for the undergraduates that I think it's a far more uh, compelling challenge if we have is irrespective of legal constraints. Um, we, we simply do not know how many Duke students are going to feel comfortable returning to campus. Um, if, if I were the parent of a freshman, I would be very concerned about, you know, is this really the right time to start a freshman year under, which is always stressful in, in the best of times, uh, under these strange and bizarre circumstances, knowing also that as you, as you intimate, you're missing out on a lot of, of 
what we've defined as the college experience in the United States, which is very different from the college experience in, in many other places. Um, for the graduate programs, it will not, you know, it, it will be different, I mean, but uh, many of our schools, Pratt among them, you know, already has online programs. So, I mean, it is not like this is totally new to us for graduate education that we have been offering variants of our curriculum or some or all of it are, on are online. Mm -hmm. We have a version of one of our master's programs that was set up before COVID where they could do the first year in China um, because the first year of this graduate program was very focused and had a pretty set core set of courses and they came to Durham for the second year for their electives. Um, um, so, you know, we know that many, for, for a variety of reasons, irrespective of the most recent federal um, pr proclamations, many of our foreign students will not be able to come to campus. So I think for our graduate programs, we have a pretty good way of, of at least contemplating delivering the educational content. Now, yes, do they miss out? Part of the whole point of going to graduate school in the US when you're from another culture is to go to the US and experience that other culture. and that we can't replicate. Yeah. Um, and, and there's no, I, I have not come up or have not read of any simple answer to that. Yeah. So the last part of my question, um, I wanna ask you specifically about race. So um, being an undergraduate advisor and to have my foot in three or four different areas of Duke, one of the things I hear mostly from black and brown students is the lack of community. Like so, so few professors that look like them, or so few professors who can, you know, understand the struggle and the and the and the, and the challenges of going to a predominantly white college when you are there. And you know, I had a white student tell me, you know, even coming from, you know, she had been the smartest kid in her school, and all of a sudden she's at Duke, and everybody around her is smart. You know, right. it's that imposter syndrome or whatever they call that. And the, so for black students and brown students, there's a part of this where there's some belief in whether it's actual or whether it's, you know, something that, that you just make up in your mind that you don't belong because you're this, you know, your, your, your peers wonder, did you get in because of affirmative action or some token or something you had to, you had to fill? And then to then be faced with so few faculty uh, that, that you can, you know, communicate have your communal relationship with to help you get through these years of college. Why is that and, and how does that evolve? What does, and I know you said earlier about the challenges of hiring, but, but why, how does that exist and how does it evolve to get, to us, get us to a better place you know, if we ever do? Yeah, well, right? so, I mean, it is a challenge and many parts of Duke and, and COVID's only gonna make this worse. Um, you know, many departments don't get to do a hire for years. So, you know, the, the process of changing the diversity of the faculty is um, inherently a very slow one, at least when you're talking about the tenure track faculty, because for you know, very good reasons, the, the size of a tenure track faculty has to be constrained. Um, there can be more rapid shifting in the, uh, in the non-tenure track faculty. So, so to the extent that many departments are, you know, use and professors the practice, um, and and other um, and other title um, other titles there, there tends to be much faster turnover in those positions and therefore more opportunities to um, uh, to bring in um, you know a, a more diversity into the faculty on on those positions in my department we've we've been blessed I mean we are one of the parts of Duke that's been growing the fastest so we've been able to do a lot of faculty hiring in recent years and so we've been able to make a um, tangible change in the complexion of our faculty because we've had the opportunity to hire a lot of people, but not many departments can say that. That is not a model that scales to a lot of the other departments that do, because it's clear if anything, they're going to be shrinking, not growing, you know, in, in the short term at least. Um, so it is very hard. I think um, though that recognizing it up front and recognizing that um, there are people beyond the faculty themselves who are very important in the lives of the students and the staff that we hire to help with students. We tend to, we, we, I don't know if it's for better or for worse, 
but we have a lot more staff in student affairs and in departments assisting with student activities and student life than we did when I was an undergraduate. Mm -hmm. And those staff, we definitely can make sure um, uh, that we apply, you know, that we go to great lengths to make sure that students will see a variety of faces and a variety of, of models um, that, that are able to talk to them about success in these disciplines. Mm -hmm. um, but we can't, you know, in, in the sciences and engineering, we can't, you know, overnight change the fact that we are still a male and white dominated um, profession. Less white dominated, frankly, because of the, you know, the, 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 the Asian students uh, and other students of color uh, from India and other countries and China um, are, you know, are, are, are a very dominant force in, in our profession now. Yeah. So certainly there are many role models other than white men, um, but there are um, not, you know, there are certainly a lot fewer role models um, for, um, you know, for dark skinned, uh, for people, for Africans and African Americans. And, and, and with that said, you know, um, I, I think I told, well, I know I told President Broadhead this, but I also think I said this to uh, President Price, you know, for a lot of black and brown staff, faculty and, uh, and students, sometimes it feels like you're, in a, in a, you're isolated and alone. You feel like you're, you're in your own little island, you know. Even for me, I mean, I'm a technologist and I still go to meetings and find myself the only person that looks like me. Um, when, when you think about that, especially in light of what has happened over the last few months, you know, with the killings of more and more black men, you know, taking a more active look at education as a whole and what it means to your economic health, you know, has to be somewhere, uh, contemplated to a point where it looks reasonable. Um, and we've had several instances on Duke's campus where students have felt isolated and alone, you know, and not, not having a base. And so as we think about things as you go forward, and you know, I know there's economics of all of these things, but if you think about these things going forward, you know, how do we reassure students that they're not isolated alone when we can't even reassure ourselves as faculty and, 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 and staff that we're not isolated and alone? Um, well, that is our challenge uh, now, right? I've, I've at least, you know, I've liked the words, they need to be followed by actions that we've had from our president in this. Um, perhaps the advantage, some advantage of technology here is that it gives us the opportunity for, for what are locally very small numbers of people to recognize that they are actually part of a much larger group, although it is dispersed in any one spot, you know, you're not going to find a lot of people who look like you, but you are not alone. Uh, that that uh, the technology that exists today, we can at least facilitate and connect you with people who have been successful, who have faced some of the same challenges as you of going through being, um, you know, not having a lot of models of your own. Um, I think some of the mentoring programs we have now, uh, the DTEC Scholars Program, which particularly targets women and underrepresented minorities in engineering, um, pairing them with, with external mentors, many of whom are Duke grads themselves, Duke alums, who have been successful, went through the same challenges, sometimes at Duke itself, and yet have been very successful in their careers as a result. I think you know the more that we can match students with ex with additional external role models, uh, while the number on campus is still, I mean, it, it's still not going to be high. No overnight switch is going to dramatically change that. But globally, there are many great success stories, and also many stories of struggle that nonetheless have led to success. And if we can connect our students better with those, uh, I think that would be useful. The DTEC program has really impressed me in, in many ways in its, uh, in, in its um, ability to um, retain uh, women and students of color in the technology disciplines, computer science, computer engineering in particular. Um, we had, I mean, at Duke, we had um, over half the students in our introductory programming and intermediate programming classes were women but the melt of those students to the major was very, very high. And that was one of the motivators for starting this up. 
and they had a 100% retention rate for the first few classes of students who did DTEC as a, as a younger student, coupled with this mentoring both from inside Duke and from outside from our alumni community, and placing them with companies that got it, companies that we had screened to know would give them a good experience and wouldn't treat them as the token women, the token black person in the group to say that, that we've, you know, our internship program made these quotas this month, that we, we, we work, they work, I can't say we, because I didn't do it, but the DTEC Scholars folks work really hard to find companies where we thought they got it. Yeah. Um, and that has, I don't know the limits of scaling that program. You know, we've grown it somewhat, um, but there is a risk in making it too big that we lose the ability to do that screening and make sure that we're finding these places that really do reassure the freshmen and sophomores especially um, that know they're not imposters. Yeah. These companies actually value what they're doing, even though they're not very well trained yet. I mean, that's, that's the real challenge is finding companies who are willing to take on the students knowing they're very early in their curriculum. They're extremely bright. They're able to learn and not assign them to give, you know, to pour coffee for the real engineers. You know, and, and we've been able to do that to this point. Um, and I think it's really curious to see how well we can scale that. Um, I've got a meeting uh, with the new director of that program tomorrow, in fact, to see if we can broaden the exposure to computer hardware companies and, and not just uh, software companies has been most of the focus to date. Mm -hmm. um, but that's what gives me some hope um, mm -hmm. that, you know, that it's not, not the campus alone, but Duke and its alumni community are able to marshal a lot of resources and in our, 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 our underrepresented alumni uh, in general seem to really want to be engaged in this and really make themselves useful to fill in part of that gap of the lack of physically on campus um, you know, uh, uh, models at any given point in time. So my last question is this. So uh, have you seen the video of Mr. Floyd's death? I have. And so what was your reaction? What, what, what emotion did you experience when you saw that? It's, it's horror and anger. Um, kind of, I don't know if there's a word for those at the same time, but um, to, to see, and, 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 and sadly, because it's not the first, right? It's because there've been so many before. It, it is, ter it is it, it's terrible that only when you have that close, that high res video with the audio, that that's what it's taking to make people realize how, uh, in what a bad position our country is in. Mm -hmm. um, we've had the same, we've had the data for decades. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that it takes as visceral an experience as this to incite, you know, the broader public uh, uh, willingness to finally admit there's a problem here that we have to solve. That makes me very sad about the state of our nation uh, and, the, and the state of, of education in our nation, that um, the data was not sufficient to make people act 20 years ago on this. Um, but that is the reality in which this nation finds itself. Yeah, and, and, and to that point, like, for black and brown students that visceral effect and that white people finally see it and hear it as something um, has been a bit overwhelming for us because like we've been dealing with this for years um, of being on the outside looking in and knowing that how tenuous our lives were, how little we were appreciated or, or recognized for anything that we brought to the table you know, and when I listen to these conversations that are going on now, I hear a lot about, you know, uh, who built this country? How did this country get to be what it is, including our own Duke, you know, going back and looking at Duke's early history, you know, all of these pieces that this one event in time has struck a chord where, you know, lynching and Jim Crow and, you know, pay and equity promotion and everything you can throw at it is not not an issue to just this one time now. Why now? Why this is the point that finally people, well, so I think there is a demographic change that is happening over time. I mean, frankly, um, some of the, the worst offenders are in the generation that is dying off. Um, and 
you know, that's, that's, it's unfortunate. That's what it's taking. Um, but that is in part what it's taking. Uh, but also I think the, that this generation, um, of people younger than me, of the, you know, the age of our students and, and graduates of the last decade or so are part of a visual and online and interactive culture. Uh, allows them to be uh, influenced by events in a way that in my time, you know, I would have exactly three lenses on the world. The three television network news programs would be the only way I had of getting information about whatever was happening in the world, being you know, Vietnam being the hot topic when, when, when I was coming up as well as civil rights movement a little bit before my time. Um, but I think the generation, you know, the generation that's willing and able and to consume the unfiltered truth for themselves and get mad about it uh, is helpful in a way that, you know, has, has not been possible certainly more than a decade ago. Still doesn't say why couldn't it have happened 10 years ago, seven years ago, five years ago, but I, but it is different than it was 20 years ago. Well, John, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for chatting with me. Um, it was and a pleasure. To converts, so. I will send you a link and you can get it and let me know if we can upload okay. it. And I, and I really encourage you to watch some of the Duke Law or Duke University student chats. They're really enlightening. They really are. And I'll, be, I'll be doing some of the, I know we're having some of the IT diversity chats coming up as well. And I'll be part of several of those on, um, coming up also. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Stay Great. safe. And I hope you have a good year. Likewise. Thank you very much, Rochelle. Good night.